Greetings, my brothers and sisters. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Eternal God, we come on this beautiful Wednesday evening to rejoice and celebrate in you. We thank you, God, for being so good to us as a church family. We thank you for blessing the new generation family. We thank you, God, for the people of God. Oh, God, I pray now for a fresh anointing in this hour. And through this talk word, God, you will give the glory. Men and women will want more of you and less of self. And we will have a zeal and a desire to stand for righteousness, stand for holiness, Stand for justice. Bless now. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Greetings to the church family, to the people of God. It's a beautiful night for us to assemble together and hear what the Lord has to say to us as believers and even to a dying world. I wanted tonight to go in a direction uh, that relates to what's happening in our communities, in our country, as it relates to violence and to the untimely death of men and women, particularly those uh, in the race of African Americans. And I stand tonight boldly on the Word of God and in confidence in knowing that this message is for us tonight to help us to be able to, for some to take the scales off our eyes, for others to be more cognizant and aware of what we face in our community and in our country. If you would travel with me tonight, to the Word of God to an Old Testament passage in the book of Amos. Amos is a book that consists of nine chapters. Amos is a prophet. It's a book that is somewhat nestled away between Daniel and Obadiah. There in the, the book of Amos chapter number five, I want us to see a few verses, but for the sake of time, we'll read one verse, and then we will share in the word. Verse 24 in the fifth chapter says this, but let judgment run down as waters and righteous as a mighty stream. I want to share tonight and just talk from one word, and that's the word tonight, justice. Many of us have used this word in many settings, in many opportunities. We've looked at this word, civil working definition brings it in line with moral righteousness, with fairness, with equality. Tonight in our country, as many protesters still walk the streets protesting and uttering the words that black lives matter. And for those of us who uh, want to look at it from a holy standpoint, let's make sure that we understand from the beginning that we do know that all lives matter. But this organization 
has come together to identify that due to the high stakes of African Americans being killed at the hands of white police officers and justice not taking place that in many cases, the majority that these officers are acquitted and walk free helps us to be able to say the term, the slogan, Black Lives Matter. Amos tonight, the prophet helps us. The prophet Amos helps us because in his ministry, and in the time of the calling of Amos, God wanted to do something. Uh, the prophet Amos comes to us in a time when God wanted to get the nation's attention. Listen to me closely. God wanted to get the nation's attention. And he uses this prophet by the name of Amos. Uh, but people were not listening just in our day and time when people are not listening. But he uses this prophet by the name of Amos to gather and gain the attention of the people. Uh, he uses in one verse the term the lion, the lion's roar, and it would make you think uh, that people could hear a lion roar or the thunder roar and know that danger was at hand. God, my brothers and sisters, this passage was speaking from Jerusalem. For many of us have come to realize that judgment uh, always starts at home and he sends a drought into the land so that even the fruitful animals uh, was withering but it didn't bring the people to their knees and I shared with you even Sunday that the people of God must get back to the neology of where every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. So God, in the midst of the people, not falling to their knees and calling on the name of Jehovah Jireh, new generation, God uses uh, this common farmer by the name of Amos to preach to his people and to warn them. His, his assignment was to warn them that a lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord has spoken. He, he has spoken and in the midst of him speaking, he comes to us with a message to remind us and to inform us uh, that God wants and God is calling out for our attention. Right in the midst of this time that we're dealing with COVID-19 and in the heat of a time of protesting in the death of George Floyd, God comes to us and reminds us that I have a prophet to remind you uh, that I need you to obey me. And I'm calling for the people of God to know that the sins of the world can cause us to miss our blessings and our breakthrough. It's interesting in chapter number five, church family and visitors tonight, uh, that Amos helps us because he deals with the lamentation 
for Israel. And then he gives an exhortation to repentance. He says, if, if I could get the people to repent, uh, not just on the local level, but even on a national level, uh, that major things will begin to happen. Amos helps us because Amos wants us to be able to see in this lamentation, we need to first look at the definition of it from the standpoint of being able to see that it deals with a time of sorrow. It deals with an expression of mourning or regret. And so Amos helps us in verse uh, number 15. He says, hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto a remnant of Joseph. He says, first of all, we, we, we need to see uh, God's justice. Hate the evil. Many of us, when in the midst of what we're facing in our country, it can drive us to evil. It can drive us to hate. But even as we look at the life of young men that have fallen to violence and have fallen to violence through police officers, we cannot go to the line of hate, but we must ask God to give us a heart of love. Love your enemies. Do good to those that despitefully use you. Justice must be at the forefront. In verse number 15, he says to us, you know, uh, there's going to be a remnant of Joseph. What does he mean by this remnant of Joseph? Even in the midst of where there is not fairness, even when people are mistreated, lied on, forsaken, he says, if you look at the life of Joseph, you will discover that although he was hated, he was forsaken, he had to spend time in prison, his brothers lied on him, God found favor with him. And I need to remind some of us tonight that no matter what you have experienced or what you may be going through or who have set you up for evil and have come up against you, that God will find favor with you. There will be a remnant of Joseph. There will be a small group that will have the favor of God that will be showered over their life. Somebody tonight in your home ought to tell God, thank you that I'm in the majority and not the minority. I'm in the group of the favor of God. That's, that's what he's saying to us. The prophet speaks to us and he speaks to us in the language of what's happening in our present day and time. Even from the time of 1619, the first enslaved African Americans arrived in Jamestown, settling there for the stage of what was identified as slavery in North America. From the time of the arrival of those in Jamestown in 1619, many of us, my brothers and sisters, at some stage from our great-grandparents to our grandparents to our parents and even to us, have faced some form of racism. Not just one form, but even those who 
received degrees and worked in corporate America and those who had opportunities of African Americans to serve these United States of America in the armed forces have faced racism. And here the prophet Amos helps us because listen to what he says to us. Uh, hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will have grace upon the remnant of Joseph. Therefore the Lord God of hosts says, listen to what he says in verse 16, Welling shall be in all streets. Now we need to understand that we're in a season and we're in a time, my brothers and sisters, uh, where welling is in the streets. What is, what is this word welling? Crying with pain, crying with grief, crying with anger. There, there are many of us uh, that have gone through some things in our families and have seen some things happen in our country, in these United States of America, that will have you welling in the streets. Uh, he says, and, and they shall say in the highways, God, God, they should call on the husband man to mourning and such as are skillful of lamentation to wailing. We're at a time where wailing is at the forefront. Think about it, my brothers and sisters, when we look at the life of men and women that have fallen to violence and wailing was in the streets wailing was in the family setting anger and grief was within the family we can go all the way back to 1955 when a little boy 14 years of age by the name of Emmett Teal was killed by some white men because they felt that he was offensive to the store owner, a white woman, took his life at a young age, taught us a valuable lesson that the black man's life has no value in the eyesight of white men. I need to remind our younger generation, our young people that you're just as intelligent, you're just as bright, and in many, many cases, you are more intelligent, your IQ is higher than your counterpart of those who may sit across the table from you. But in so many instances and cases, we've allowed the enemy to try to dilute, to try to rob us of our knowledge and our ability and our skills. And we've settled for normalcy. We've settled for average. But I came to tell us tonight that we can move from the content and the mindset of the willing in the streets. Emmett Teal was a valuable lesson for us to be able to teach our sons and daughters that even what happened in 1955 still is happening in 2020. And the, the case reminds us that those officers were released, they were acquitted in Mississippi. Bring it even up to date in the life of a young man by the name of Michael Brown in broad wailing in the streets. A hurting mother, a loving father, a family that had to see their son put to rest with no justice at hand. We are crying out, saints, for justice, but not only are we crying out on the judicial and the legislative system, we're believing God that God is going to continue and God is getting ready to expose those in authority and those in high places to be exposed that every force and every demonic spirit that comes up against the people of God shall be revealed. We don't have to just look at the life of an Emmett Till or Michael Brown. We can look at the life of an Eric Gardner. And it can remind us, my brothers and sisters, 
that there's welling in the streets. There's welling in the streets and there's welling in the highways and uh, there, there's the lamentation of the expression of sorrow and mourning and regret. Eric Gardner's situation teaches us that. His death is a reminder to us that we have sons and we must teach our sons and our grandsons how to survive and how to be able to cope when they go out and they meet mean and nasty people on the street or police officers that will not value the life of a black man. So when we begin to talk about Black Lives Matter, and those of us who are holy and want to say all lives matter, all lives do matter. But statistics will reflect and reveal that the lives of the black men will not have value to the system and the system will care nothing about them. And I know some of you that are tuned in now are scratch, scratching your head and squirming in your seat because, you know, you tell preachers, uh, stick to the gospel. And this is the gospel. The prophet Amos helps us. Y'all talk back to me tonight. You know, stay away from politics and we want to stay away from it as long as it's not affecting us. But then when trouble ring our doorbell, we want somebody to come to our rescue. Somebody ought to tell God, thank you. They were welling in the streets. Bring it, bring it even to the life of Auburn Ahmad in Brunswick, Georgia. And you will be able to see uh, that even back in February, February 23rd, the brothers just at the age of 25, just beginning to enjoy life from a standpoint of corporate America, jogging, minding his own business. And men want to say that they think that he's one that may be trying to break into homes. Teaches us a valuable lesson that not only must we be standing for justice, there have to be some prayer warriors that is interceding for family members, even when they're at recreational settings, even when they're at community events. And one of those men videoed this crime. And we're going to have to stand behind the fact of believing that justice will be served for the life of Aubrey. Well, bring it even closer for us, welling in the streets. Black Lives Matter, African American Lives Matter, my brothers and sisters. When we're in corporate America, and even myself can attest working in corporate America, they would ask me questions like, where did you come from? How did you get this job? Where did you go to school? They, they would minimize Michael Jenkins. They would minimize Teller, the conversations, and think that the only thing I could talk about was sports. They box us in. They think that when we're in corporate America that we are there uh, as just a token. But we need to be reminded that God has not identified us as tokens. God loves the just as well as the unjust. God loves the learned as well as the unlearned. And God has put us in a position where we can be escalated. We can go up the ladder of success and be a blessing in large corporations. And we must remind our sons and our daughters, no matter how high you go, you're still black. Even, I, even if you marry a Hispanic, even if you marry a white woman, you need to be reminded you that you are still black. Oh, I, I, I know some of you are saying, come on, Pastor, help us tonight. That's what I'm doing. Trayvon Martin, welling in the streets. Right here from our city, Right here from Michael Crop High School, spending time with his father in Stanford, Florida, gunned down, system 
broken. No justice. No peace. We declare in this day and time that even we as men and women of God will stand for righteousness and stand for justice. We're reminded even 40 years ago, 40 years ago last month, Brother Jenkins, you remember it. Brother Teller, you remember Arthur McDuffie. My friend and I, Aaron Everett, was riding our bicycles down 17th Avenue on a Saturday evening, and we saw all these cars on fire. We saw vehicles on 62nd Street, Aaron and I, being turned over. And we didn't know what was happening because we had not tuned into the news. But an all-white jury had found these police officers, found them innocent, acquitted them of the death of Arthur McDuffie that had taken place in 1979. He was a man that was an insurance salesman, 33 years of age, had a son, just a toddler, and his life was taken, and these officers were, were set free. Our community burned. Many businesses burned down and never reopened. Over 18 lives were taken. Over 600 people were arrested. It made a major difference in our community. And here we are 40 years later, still wailing in the streets, wailing now at the feet and the format and the doorstep of the life of what has happened to George Floyd. Taken down as a young man. Officer places his foot, his knee on his neck, rather. Puts his foot, his knee on his neck. The brother's crying out that I can't breathe. Wailing in the street. But we as men and women of God must make up our mind that we will not just be emotional driven by those eight minutes and 46 seconds. And what I mean by being emotional driven, we'll just not linger on protesting, but we'll believe God and we will demand justice. Not only will we demand justice, we'll take a stand in looking at the police reform. But we, not only will we do that, but we will make the decisions that are properly and correct when it comes to voting, not just for a president of the United States, and God knows we have to vote in November. But we must be reminded that voter suppression still exists. Just Tuesday night, last night, in Atlanta, Georgia, when many went out to vote, in the African American communities, they were able to see voter suppression. They stood in line for two hours and three hours only to discover that out of the machines that were in the voting precinct, at some locations, only two or three machines were working. Not only that, well, was there a limitation of machines, but even if they went down the street and rode into Cobb County and rode into the white neighborhoods, they discovered that there were no lines and that their machines were working. Voter suppression is a way to get us to become discouraged and say that I'm not going to vote or that my vote will not make a difference. And my brothers and sisters, we cannot allow the month of November to slip up on us and we have the mindset that voting does not count. We must press our way to the polls and we must remind our family members to go to the polls because our country needs healing. The land needs healing, and healing has to start in high places. Not only must we take a stand there, but on the local level, even in our communities, there's welling in the street. And we must make sure that the right officials are placed in office. There must be men and women that will stand for righteousness, 
have morals and values attached to them, have integrity at the forefront, and foremost have the love of God in their hearts. They were willing in the streets in the text, my brothers and sisters. The prophet Amos is crying out for the day of the Lord. It was dark and there was no light. That's verse 18 and many of us feel right now that we're in a state of darkness. As for the man did flee from the lion and as soon as he fleed from the lion, he runs into the bag. That's verse number 19. And that's what sin, like many of us feel, that we can't get a breakthrough. Help me somebody. If it ain't one thing, it's another. Once we come through one situation, we find ourselves facing another circumstance. The verse says, as soon as they escape and get away from the lion, then there's the bear. And then he feels that he can get away from the bear and he goes into his house and leans his hand on the wall and he's bitten by a serpent. Good God Almighty. There are attacks on every side. The assignment of the enemy is still to kill, steal, and destroy. But my brothers and sisters, I came to remind us tonight, even in the midst of darkness, there's still a bomb in Gideon. I need to remind you that Jehovah Jireh is still on the throne and that God is watching over us. I keep telling the church of new generation that God is up to something. God is getting ready to expose more of the unjust. God is getting ready to let his hand be pressed down on those that have come up against us. Because the enemy is aware that when we begin to pray more to God and we begin to worship him, that strange and unusual things begin to happen. Our cry and our call is for justice. I love Joseph when he says, you bid it for evil. You press down on my neck with your need for evil. But God is going to bring some good out of it. Some good that our country will never be the same. Some good that not only will African Americans stand up, but brown people will stand up. People of all nationalities, all backgrounds, and all denominations will join in in knowing that black lives do matter. White boys and black boys will be able to join hands together because black lives do matter. They matter not only on the street, but they matter in the White House. They matter in high places. And parents, you ought to tell your sons and your daughters that their life has value. We ought to be able to tell our children that they were born and they were created for purpose. And we ought to take a stand for righteousness. Listen to what he says to us in verse 24. But let judgment run down as wars and righteous as a mighty stream. And so I, my challenge to the church and to the people of God is don't be ashamed of your race. Don't be ashamed of your background or your history. But somebody ought to shout, this is just the beginning. God is getting ready to do some awesome things in your life. Your life matters. Love yourself. Love your life. Stand on the word of God and God will bless you beyond measures. Our lives, they matter. And since they matter, they have value. And because we're people of value, we have to take a stand. Stand, my brothers and sisters. Stand, church family knowing that all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. God bless you. God keep you. Is our prayer. Let's pray. Turn to God.
God, we are so gracious and kind and thankful to you tonight. You've given us these moments to just declare and decree in your word that justice we stand for. God, let us not be ashamed of our race, our creed, our background, but let us stand. Stand as a beacon light in a dark world, letting it be known that the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life. Bless your people. Bless the new generation family. Although we're physically separated, thank you, God, that we're spiritually connected. Keep us faithful. Keep us strong. Keep us wise. Keep us trusting and believing in you. Bless now and I pray, God, if there are any among us that are not saved, that salvation will join with them tonight. And they can pray the sinner's prayer, that their life will never be the same. They can call them tonight. God, we can lead them to you. I pray for growth in our church, growth in our families. I pray for the city of Obelaka now. God bless every elected official. God touch in our country. Welding in our neighborhoods, welding in our streets. The death of young men and women. God, I pray for their families now. I pray for peace over their homes and their loved ones. In the mighty name of Jesus, comfort their hearts in this season. In Jesus' name, amen. Salvation is of the Lord. You can call in at 305-762-9623. We will share with you the plan of salvation. New Generation family, thank you for joining in. Visitors, thank you for joining in. Remember justice. Remember black lives do matter. We always share in the time of worshiping and giving. I ask the New Generation family now, for those who've tuned in and have shared, uh, that if you will go to the app and you will give an offering tonight to our church family, those who share with us near and far, if you will go into the app tonight and give an offering to the church of new generation, we thank you. We pray for God's blessings over you. Let's share in our closing prayer benediction. We'll see you on Sunday morning at 8 a.m. Eternal God, we thank you for this hour. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your people. I pray for this word tonight from the prophet Amos that our people will take a stand for justice stand for righteousness. Bless our offering tonight as we bring our gifts unto you. Bless the families and loved ones. Keep us the remainder of this week, even as we prosper through a pandemic. Let your favor reign upon us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with these people now and forever. Let the church say, Amen.